Welcome back, everyone. Um, <coughs> for those of you who've already forgotten, my name is Mark Pragnell. I'm back for the second shift. Um, I'm going to continue my little talk on have we really turned the corner economically, otherwise known as can an economist really be positive? Um, I'll give you a, a great adage that uh, sums up the chances of an economist being really positive, which is it is reputed that economists have forecast nine out of the last five recessions. <laughs> um, at any rate, I'm, I'm very much on that side of the optimism equation, I think. Um, what I want to do in this session is actually look forward. We've done the facts stuff, what's happened. Um, now I want to do what could well be the fiction of what I think is going to happen in the future. Um, this is a section where you may well think I am talking nonsense or something even more rude. Um, if you believe that, feel free to interrupt and tell me so. Um, I'm quite happy to accept a degree of, of, of interaction, as it were, and, 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 and interrogation and, uh, and the rest uh, through this session, if that's OK. Um, importantly, though, even if you don't believe what I say about the future for the UK economy over the next couple of years, hopefully what we can do over the next half hour is stimulate some ideas and thoughts about what might happen and take, for you to take those through the rest of today um, in terms of thinking through what the implications might be for your businesses. Okay. Um, so we've done the economic context, we've done the Lehman legacy, and we've done 2013, which was starting to look quite good. Now I want to look to the future, and I've got three sections in this slide pack. Firstly, I just want to try and talk about a couple of the issues that people are flagging already in terms of the extent to which the consumer recovery or the consumer tentative recovery is secure. So can we trust it? And actually, I'm going to be positive. I'm going to say yes, well, I think we can. Then I'm going to say what we think at Capital Economics are the prospects for 2014 in the UK and beyond. And then finally, I've got a few slides where I just want to think about some broader issues. And actually, my view is that I will come to it. There is a one big threat to the UK economy, domestically, but there are actually quite some significant threats to the UK economy internationally. And I just want to end with just running through what some of those might be. OK. Right. Can we trust a consumer a recovery? Um, first question is, can consumer confidence continue to rise? And people have argued that and as I'll show you in a moment, consumer confidence is rising, people have argued it's clearly some form of blip. All right, there's the graph. Um, what I use here is the GFK NOP um, study, which is actually the thing that feeds in, or at least used to, um, feed into the Eurobarometer survey across Europe. Um, it's not a bad survey, it's not a brilliant survey, but it's one that's been, it's been going for quite some time, and it's asked quite a few questions, and the answers to some of the questions are more interesting than the answers to some of the other ones. Um, here, we're looking at the answers to questions about what people think are their personal financial circumstances and the outlook for them, and the economic outlook. And they are expressed as balances. A negative number means more people think it's going to get worse than it's going to get better. A positive number means more people think it's going to get better than it's going to get worse. Um, the important thing is that in 2008, unsurprisingly, everyone went negative as the economy tanked. But after lots and lots of ups and downs, we have seen the beginning of an upward swing in confidence in recent months. And in fact, we are now into positive territory for only the first sustained period since 2008. So there is consumer confidence there, but it's only early days. This may seem like the bleeding obvious, but it is worth stating nevertheless. The more confidence you have in consumers, the more they're willing to spend. Um, and importantly, the, the, the question that is really relevant out of the GFK report is people's views of their pina personal financial circumstances. And as you can see in that graph, the views on their personal financial service, uh, circumstances is actually pretty well correlated to growth in spending in retail sales as well. Now, I think there is good reason to believe that this uptick 
in consumers' confidence is sustainable. I think there is rising confidence, and I think we can expect it to continue through this year. Actually, I, can I think we can expect it to continue through next year as well. Why? Well, the first one is that, actually, the house price issue has a very significant impact on people's perceptions of their personal financial circumstances. Having a, having a lump of concrete, brick and tile that has the ability to be sold for a slightly higher price than it was last year seems to actually have a very big impact in people's willingness to spend money in a certain year or not. There are bloody good reasons for that. We've got a mortgage market which allows people to, to, to get money, to remortgage money out of the property if it appreciates. And also what you'll find is that as, as, as property prices appreciate, people move more, which also stimulates demand in itself as well for retail sales. So although I put it in a pejorative fashion, actually it does make sense. And what we are seeing now is we are seeing, certainly in the southeast of England and in some other areas, but not across the country as a whole, not for every part of the country at least, uh, we are seeing house prices rise, we are seeing property wealth rise, and with that, we've got a good foundation for consumer confidence. Unemployment looks likely to fall further, and again, there is a strong correlation between employment prospects, unemployment, and people's confidence in their financial circumstances. Again, in many respects, the bleeding obvious, but worth saying nevertheless. And finally, and most importantly, what we think we're going to see now, and we have just started to see, in fact, you've probably read the headlines about it over the last few days, we're now seeing inflation rates lower than average wage growth. Real incomes, real earnings are starting to grow again. And that is massively important for people's willingness in terms of the willingness to spend money in the shops and elsewhere. Again, one of the best correlations we've got between the confidence measure is actually the confidence measure against real earnings. Cannot, you cannot understate the importance of the swing in the real earnings issue. The recession up to 2008, 2012, 2013, a period identified with declining real incomes. Now we're starting to see that swing for people actually having incomes that, that grow in such a way that means they can buy more this year than they could last year. The second, excuse me, the next water. The second um, issue the naysayers will come out with. The people who think that this can only be a blip, it's transitionary, it won't, it won't stay. The second issue that the naysayers will come out with is that surely this is yet another debt-fueled consumer-led boom. Admittedly, our export performance has been dismal. Um, we've had a period up until now where actually the pound wasn't as strong as it might otherwise have been and we still couldn't export. Now we've got the pound strengthening again. We haven't got a cat's chance in hell of improving our export performance in the short term. However, that doesn't mean that a consumer-led recovery is a d necessarily a dangerous thing. Now, the naysayers will point to the savings ratio. So this is the amount of, the, the percentage of income that, that households do not spend. Doesn't mean it's necessarily going into a piggy bank, but it's going into, it's going into things that aren't, in, aren't um, expenditure items in that year. And the UK has for some time been a dreadful um, economy in terms of rates of savings. Uh, you will have possibly also read that these numbers are very soon, or in fact have now been doubled by the Office for National Statistics because they've decided to throw in a whole raft of bizarre calculations around pension funding. Um, but ignoring and outstripping all this new stuff that the, the ONS is doing, uh, our savings performance is poor. It did improve through the recession, unsurprisingly. It has started to decline again, even in 2013. So the naysayers will be concerned. They'll say, look at this. You've got savings reducing again. This means consumers are starting to get out of control again. But I am completely unconvinced by that. Firstly, is actually we've got nowhere near the sorts of level of growth in consumer credit as we had during the years of the, the run-up to the recession. 
there is some growth in unsecured borrowing at the moment. There's precious, precious little growth at all in mortgage borrowing. Um, part of that is because the banks aren't willing to put the money across, but a part of that is consumers are more careful. Um, in terms of the unsecured borrowing, even the rates of growth we're seeing at the moment are nowhere near the levels we saw pre-2008. Uh, and that's across a large chunk of the different ways in which you can get unsecured borrowing in the UK. And that's despite, actually, some really historically low rates of interest on unsecured debt. So we've got low rates of interest on unsecured debt. We still don't have anywhere near the sorts of rates of growth in the take-up of unsecured debt that we had before 2008. So I'm unconvinced on that score. But also, although the savings ratio isn't that great, we have seen a significant improvement over the, since the recession in the amount of savings to draw, be drawn upon by consumers. Household bank deposits have gone up quite a bit since 2008. And of course, regardless of all of that, there is an improving housing market, and a housing market now which means that, again, we're seeing consumers, seeing household wealth, including housing wealth, um, back above levels prior to 2008. And my old favourite friend, fret not, actually you can spend a bit more if your real incomes are rising. So I am unconvinced that the sorts of increase that we're seeing in consumer confidence, the sorts of increase we're seeing in consumer activity, the increases we're seeing in consumer debt, I don't think they're anywhere near the sorts of levels that would be required to get concerned about them being some, for, some form of unsustainable bubble. I think the consumer growth can sustain itself. So, what does that mean in terms of the prospects for this year and beyond? Um, capital economics has, a, has a, a history of being known for being one of the most pessimistic bunch of economists on the planet. Um, but we've, we've completely changed that. Uh, we have now a set of forecasts where we are, certainly for the out two years, uh, one of the, we are actually the most bullish um, commentators and forecasters in, for the UK economy currently, independent, independent forecasters. There you've got um, forecasts for real GDP growth for 2014, 15 and 16. You've got uh, what we are suggesting, which is the, uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty colour blind, so I think it's red. Um, for the second bar, you've got what, um, you've got what the Office for, for, for Budget Responsibility, so the independent Treasury people, are saying on the left. Uh, then you've got the Bank of England's latest forecast. You've also got what I've described as consensus, which is the average of all independent forecasters um, published by the Treasury. Most fundamentally important thing is that we are saying, as are most of the others, we are going to see growth over the next few years above trend rates. So above two and a quarter percent per annum. Um, not massive. Um, the best you've got is you've got the Bank of England reckon you might get over over three percent this year. But most are in somewhere in the region of two and a half to three percent for the three years we're looking out. But growth rates which are substantially higher than we've seen recently, um, and are as I say above long term trend. Still, it will take us some time to recover what we have lost, but nevertheless a much more positive outlook. Um, it ain't down to him, though. Um, firstly, the budget. Um, we had a budget last month. Um, actually, the macroeconomic implications of the budget are diddly squat. Um, and on top of that, I think there is still an argument to be had about whether Osborne austerity was the right way of doing things, whether or not we could have been somewhere else quicker with a different form of of, 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 of macroeconomic planning. And we've got a fair few arguments to be had in terms of whether or not he's got the right outlook looking forward as well. Um, but importantly, and this is one, one, of the, one of the big swings that is happening now, is that the outlook for government finances are much better than they were a few years ago. And Osborne is pretty well on target for whatever version of his, of his targets he was after now. Um, but he doesn't have to spend too much time worrying about getting another few pounds out of Eric Pickles and local authorities anymore. 
Um, in that context, actually, the UK is looking pretty good in terms of its performance on growth terms. Of course, remember, lots of these other economies didn't fall anywhere near as far as we fell. But in terms of upcoming growth, the UK is topping the G7 and actually isn't that far off the overall global average. And again, I will flat put this up now. You'll get it later as, a, as an email. Those are our key indicators for the UK economy. Um, and they're all looking pretty healthy. The one that, that I think is important to flag up is that we still think, and our forecasts are based upon, interest rates staying at relatively low levels this year, not moving at all this year, and only moving during next year by a small amount. Um, in fact, I said I thought there was one important domestic risk to my forecasts, and that risk is the Bank of England. Um, this character came from Canada with lots of good intentions, lots of bright ideas, and introduced forward guidance. Uh, forward guidance basically telling the markets that we're not going to move interest rates, we're going to stick it, we're going to stick low until. And then he came out with the, what the until was. And the until was meant to be something that wouldn't happen for two to three years. It took about eight months, in fact less. That, basically, that was unemployment hitting 7%. He has, in one fell swoop, destroyed the credibility of forward guidance, destroyed the credibility of his position of being able to say, I will keep interest rates low, because he bet on red and it came up black. For me, it is essential that this economy is kept nurtured and growth is nurtured for the next 18 months as a minimum. And that means keeping base rates down. And it means not unwinding quantitative easy, easing too quickly or if at all over that time period. Um, I think that's what he wants to do. I think in his heart of hearts, that's what he thinks is right. But he's left himself very different. He's left himself in a very difficult position in terms of how he can defend that now, given what was quite simply a cock-up of the forward guidance. But assuming that he plays his cards well, I'm mixing my betting metaphors there badly, um, assuming he plays his cards well and we keep interest rates low, we can expect to see growth in real earnings, albeit Slow growth, but growth in real earnings, and we can expect that to have a significant impact on your consumers. We expect consumer expenditure to increase by about 2.5% per annum. Um, obviously, retail sales may be a tad lower than that, but not far off it. Um, we expect to see volume growth in big ticket items over the next couple of years. Again, look at the pack after this for, for, for the detail. Um, and, volume, and, and value growth in, in them as well, and basically value growth in areas where people are saying, thank God for that, I've got a bit more cash, let's have some fun. Right. Global threats. So, so far, the Lehman legacy, the recession was pretty dire. 2013, start to turn the corner. Can we trust the turning of the corner? Yes, I think we can. What are the prospects for the future? Actually, not bad. But. The, the global issues are serious and significant, and they do weigh upon the UK economy, OK? Actually, we're all focused, and I think quite rightly, politically, quite rightly, morally, etc., on Ukraine. Um, actually, 
the, U the linkages between the, the issues in, the Ukra in Ukraine, we don't call it the Ukraine anymore, is it? That's not, still. Uh, the issues in Ukraine and the issues in Russia, the UK is one of the, one of the least um, potentially impacted economies. It's not a big deal here. Um, I also think that there's a, just a, there's, there's, a, there's a serious misreading of what's going on with Russia at the moment and Ukraine, in that we in Europe and North America, um, we've forgotten about the Cold War, and we've had a massive, we've had a massive overhaul of the bureaucracy, the intellectual elites, and everything that everywhere that you know, organisations since the Cold War and now, and the people the people who now run the Western world aren't of the Cold War era. That's not the case in Russia. They may be the same age, however, they all still have, in some way, military or security service backgrounds. And that is a picture of Putin in his KGB outfit um, when he signed up, or well, a couple of years after he signed up to the, to, to the security service. There is just a fundamental ingrained nature about thinking about the world in the Cold War way that's still there, which we've lost. And when you think of it in that, that context, actually what Ukraine was doing, Ukraine was playing a game of bluff about allowing the Russians access to their most important naval base. In the, in the Cold War era, that would, that was, that would, you know, we would have seen that instantly as being something you don't do. Um, and in many respects, all that Russia has done is they've responded in exactly the same way they would have done 20 years ago and say, we don't have people mucking around with our military assets. Anyway, that's an aside. It is an aside as well economically for the UK. But China isn't. There you've got some indication of the scale of the BRIC economies versus the UK and also the scale of their trading position as well. Um, Russia is still quite small fry. China is not. And you do have to have some concerns about China at the moment. It's a graph of the percentage of GDP, the percentage of economic output, which is accounted for by investment. Now, investment is a good thing. I'm not, you know, we don't have enough of it in the UK. However, there's only so much of it that you can really viably do. And you've got to recognise that a balanced economy as well as it has consumers, it has businesses, it has investment, etc. Almost a half of GDP in China is accounted for by investment, and the trend is still upwards. That is unsustainable. More worryingly, recently, that investment spend in China has been funded by a very significant explosion of credit. The extent now that China has outstanding debts equivalent to two years worth of economic output. And this is the slide that I really do like to try and bring that to light. This gives you an indication of the scale of um, private credit, scale of credit held as a percentage of GDP across a whole series of um, emerging markets. All the ones in red subsequently have had a banking crisis, some of them quite seriously. All the ones in blue so far haven't had a banking crisis. As you can see, China stands alone as being at the higher, higher end of that group in terms of not yet having a banking crisis. I'm not saying it will, but there are some substantial threats to the global economy through the unbalanced current growth of the Chinese economy. And it's gone away out of the newspapers, but the issue is still there, finally, which is of the euro. And here, capital economics does have a very strong view. Um, in terms of the euro, yes, a lot, have been, a lot has been done to ensure that some countries and some banking systems got through 
a couple of bad years. But underpinning the currency, there are still massive structural differences between the peripheral states and, in fact, even some northern European states and the likes of Germany. Germany has been very efficient and productive and has generated massive surpluses. Much of the rest of Europe hasn't. And at some point in time, that will come home to roost. I'll give you one way in which that might come home to roost, which is this is the um, target to euro system banking balances. Um, it's basically the way in which banks across the eurozone clear each other's debts. And effectively, what should happen over within relatively short periods of time is that there should be balance between the different economies, that if someone's borrowed too much, they should be lent, they, 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 they should be, there should be um, savings in return to that, or deposits in return to that. Actually, and you can see throughout most of the life of the Eurozone, that balance has been preserved. Actually, since the crisis, and still continuing, there are massive liabilities across the Eurozone system where effectively peripheral states, Greek banks, have failed to service their liabilities in Germany and elsewhere in Northern Europe. That at some point either involves massive state transfers or it involves some form of dis dissolution of the, Euro Euro uh, the single currency. Neither has really been addressed yet by, Br by Brussels. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. And in conclusion, I, I think I started off with a question which was, oh, no, excuse me. Uh, can an economist really be positive? Uh, and the answer is yes, for once. Um, what I've said is, although GDP remains below its 2008 peak, the UK economy is now on what I think is a strong and sustainable growth path. Um, there is no credit bubble, inflation is below target, and there's no reason for the bank to upset the apple cart and raise rates soon or far. Fingers crossed. Retail sales should continue to improve, but don't expect to price up too soon, of course. And now the internet is well, a well-established channel. But although Russia Ukraine is important politically, it is an economic sideshow. Please do, though, watch out for what happens in China. And don't be surprised if the Eurozone starts taking up the headlines again sometime over the next 18 months. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, that, that was fascinating. Don't you? The, um, you haven't mentioned uh, forward liabilities and debt overhead. Um, you know, I mean, we just heard that we're now at 1.2 trillion of public sector debt. If you read any of the Money Week stuff and you factor in pension liabilities, we're at anywhere between 5 and 900% of GDP. Yep. Um, that's a hell of a hill to climb up to get get back to, you know. Uh, yeah. So, what, what, what effect is that going to have? Right. The, okay. Um, the whole pensions thing, uh, ig ignoring, okay, structurally, we are stuffed when it comes to pensions because we still haven't yet recognised how much more we have to work in order to because of because of increasing life expectancy. Okay, and that will happen. It just has to happen. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the financial aspects of the pension problem come from a lack of recognition of the structural issue. Okay, but I think that's that's been there for ages. It will get resolved at some point in time, but it will get resolved by us working longer years. Simple as that. Um, in terms of the more short-term issues, like government debt or the rest of it, uh, yes, you're right, there's a lot there. However, the issue is, can you service the debt? And you're more likely to be able to service the debt in an environment where you've got growth. So the debt becomes a real problem when you're already in, on, on a downward decline. It becomes a vicious circle. As we start to see a world where actually we've got sustainable growth, all of that becomes better because the debt pro the, because the, the debt repayment becomes less of the becomes less of GDP fundamentally. So I'm not arguing they're not problems, but they are not as big a problem in a growth environment as they have been in an environment where you could not see the growth happening. Okay, I'm, I'm just thinking the risks to 
with the, you know, if you look at the private sector as you've outlined, individuals have been taking quite a uh, tight view of their debt circumstances and paying back debt. Yep. Um, but as a nation, we're still adding 100 billion a year to our. The, the, the flip side that is, bus is business side though, and again, business has been pretty cautious over the recession as well in terms of the debt position. And yes, you're right, um, you know, so it's always the way. Governments are always about five years behind where they should be. Um, and the public debt is an issue, it needs to be controlled, etc., etc. Um, but that is only one part of the overall, the overall balance sheet for the nation. And actually, I think we economists have been quite surprised by the scale of rebalancing that's occurred both in the household sector and the business sector as well. So it's a factor, but it's not going to... I'm not, I'm not saying it's not going to. Um, you, you, it, it, it's undoubtedly a risk, but it's, but it's, but it's one that I think... It's, it's not one that I think is... is, is but, go out, put it away. Given that risk, I would, I'm, you, know, you saw what the forecasts were, that's, that's, where, that's where we think it is regardless. No. Um, Scottish referendum? <laughs> Um, right, okay, I've got a very different view to capital economics on, on, on the Scottish um, referendum. Um, I will, first and foremost, if they vote for independence, um, there, is, there, is just the, there is just the irritation and transactional issues, or sorry, transitional issues, and that's a cost to everyone. Uh, it's a pain in the neck, it'll happen, blah, 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 blah. Um, what does it mean economically? Well, I'm very much of the view that England will be better off without them. Um, and um, I don't see why we don't have a vote for, for, for rejecting parts of, the, parts of the UK that are both noisy and unproductive. Um, but... <laughs> um, I, well, I live in London, but I don't want to either, but still. Um, the, 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 issue, the issue with Scotland is that it's arguable exactly what they'll get from the oil. They run a quite substantial public sector deficit. Um, and not scaremongering, but there are real regulatory and legislative problems for their financial sector being based up there if they're actually doing business in England. Um, so, at the moment, for me, I, I, I don't see an economic rationale for, at all, actually, for Scottish independence. Um, I can see why there may well be historic, political, cultural reasons for it, but, uh, but, it's, but, but, I, but for, for me, the argument seems pretty one way. Um, people will argue with me as to whether or not it's a good or bad thing for England. But I think it's quite difficult to see the, the it's quite difficult to see the, the positives for Scotland um, economically. Thank you very much.